election day is over the beginnings of World War I. And we're going to look at how the United States got involved in the war and what effect the war had on the United States. Some things we're not going to look at today are to your side, individual battles, or, uh, or anything in particular really in getting involved in the trench warfare. First, let's review how the war began. Uh, use the acronym MAIN to help you remember what brought Europe into war in 1914. Militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Militarism would be the, the large buildup in America's, in Germany and Britain's navies uh, and others around the world before World War I. Uh, alliance, the alliance system, uh, we will cover extensively. You had the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance. Uh, this is going to be, this is going to create the spiraling effect of uh, bringing, us, bringing the world into the chaos of World War I. Imperialism, uh, the competition between the nations for uh, territories around the world. And then lastly, uh, we have nationalism, where different peoples from around the world uh, were clamoring for independence we're going to see that rear its ugly head uh, in the Balkans, especially. All right, when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was shot and killed on June 28, 1914, it set off a chain reaction that no one would really attempt to stop. A month later, the Great War would begin. However, it would be three more years before the United States would enter the war. Ferdinand was shot by a group called the Black Hand in Sarajevo. This allowed the alliance system to fulfill its fateful journey of taking a small regional conflict into global war. Austria-Hungary, a fledgling empire on its last legs, was trying to hold on to its possessions and loot to their neighbor and ally Germany for assistance. Now, down here in the Balkan Peninsula, you have Serbia, Bosnia, Montenegro, all these areas looking for independence from Austria-Hungary. And this is the idea of nationalism. Serbia is wanting to unite all of the Serbs in this area into one, uh, in one independent country. Uh, this is what's driving the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The Balkan area here was known as the powder keg of Europe. Uh, in, the 19, in 1912, 1913, uh, there were small conflicts or war between Italy and the Ottoman Empire, for example, uh, for the, this area of Albania. Bulgaria is going to attack the Ottoman Empire uh, and, and try to gain uh, more territory. So small conflicts have been going on. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand is going to bring these small conflicts up to the mainland of the continent of Europe in 1914. The little area here of Serbia, uh, feeling that the idea of the heat of not only the large uh, Empire of Austria-Hungary, but now Germany, coming down on it, asks and gets assistance from its neighbor and uh, historical protector, Russia. Uh, Russia and uh, France have an alliance that's going to help bring France into this war. So suddenly we have the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand uh, going from a conflict between Serbia and Austria-Hungary to be Serbia, Austria, Hungary, and Germany. The Russia protecting Serbia is going to bring Russia into it. And since Russia and France have a pact, it's going to bring France into the war. Now, the last thing here, uh, as Germany invades Belgium in August 1914, Britain honors this, this long obligation in defense of Belgium and declares war on Germany. Great Britain also has an alliance with France. Uh, or well, to, um, to take. it's not an alliance in the same as Russia and France, uh, but they do have some ties. So Great Britain is not going to be drawn into this war. So you have assassination of one individual and a regional conflict of Austria-Hungary now involving really the six or the five, uh, one, two, three, four, five major powers of Europe. Uh, the Ottoman Empire will get involved not only six. Italy, which is supposed to have an alliance. Austria, Hungary, and Germany uh, backs out, citing that their alliance is for defensive purposes and that it's not, uh, they are fighting offensive wars, so Italy does not get involved until 1915 when they switch sides and fight for France and Great Britain and Russia. Uh, essentially, Italy is trying to grab land and territory in this area right in here. 
Now, what are we doing in the United States? Uh, we are following the advice, the advice of President George Washington and not being involved in European affairs. Uh, as the years dragged on, this became more and more difficult to do. In 1914, uh, we had, President Wilson had issued the proclamation of strict neutrality, but we are neutral in name only. Uh, we are trading extensively with the allies of Great Britain and France, and not so much with Germany and Austria-Hungary. One of those, uh, one of the reasons why is it is historical. We have not traded with Germany and Austria-Hungary uh, that much up to this point. And the other is militarily. Great Britain had set up a blockade uh, of the North Sea, you see it way up here, uh, and they were blockading down here and not letting uh, raw materials, food, etc., get into Germany. That's going to help play out at the end of the war and help drive the end of the war when uh, Germany kind of disintegrates from within. The first event really that helps drive the United States into the war is the sinking of the ship Lusitania off the coast of Ireland in May of 1915. 120 Americans were killed. Uh, it was known to the Germans that the ship was actually carrying uh, some contraband, some war material. The Germans sunk it, uh, but it raised a fear in the United States. Ships carrying Americans were sunk by U-boats throughout the next year, including ships called the Arabic and the Sussex. Outrage over the sinking of the Sussex uh, caused the Germany, Germany to issue the Sussex Pledge. The Sussex Pledge said that they would warn ships before they fired on them and would allow passengers to get off. Um, Germany did not want the United States to enter the war on the side of the Allies. Uh, they were looking to, at this point still to avoid conflict with the United States. That will change in a, a year or so. Two events in March of 1917 uh, finally propelled America into the war. The Bolshevik Revolution in Russia resulted in that nation bowing out of the war. That meant the Central Powers could then focus all of their efforts on the on the Western Front. While the United States was technically neutral, uh, our sentiments, especially by this time, rested with France and Great Britain. The idea of our close allies losing helped push President Wilson to ask for war. Wilson ran for election, or re-election, excuse me, in November of 1916 on the campaign slogan, he kept us out of the war. And yet, uh, here he is, a month after taking the oath of office for his second term, of, second term as president, uh, persuading Congress to declare war on Germany and Austria-Hungary. The same month of uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Zimmerman note surfaced, and the foreign minister of Germany had tried to persuade Mexico to form an alliance with the United States where Mexico would attack uh, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona to help draw American troops out of the southern United States and prevent them from going over to Europe. Uh, Mexico would receive those territories in return while Germany would then be able to defeat the Allies over in Europe. Germany would also resume uh, unrestricted submarine warfare against all shipping uh, if you remember just a minute ago, I talked about the Sussex Pledge. They're now going to uh, abandon the Sussex Pledge and just say, you know what, if the ship's out of the water, we're going to sink it. This was the last straw. On April 6, 1917, the United States declared war on Germany and the Central Powers. The German command thought it would be a long time before American troops would begin arriving in Europe. They thought wrong. In reality, though, American troops played a relatively minor role in the war. Our arrival helped push the, Amer the Germans into submission. Uh, but we did not arrive in massive numbers uh, until late, uh, until the summer of 1918, when the war is essentially uh, drawing to an end. But how did the war affect the United States? Uh, the American economy benefited greatly from the war, even before the war ended, even before we entered the war. The farming industry was suddenly feeling the effects of the war uh, when it became the, uh, the kitchen and the breadbasket to the world during the war feeding the Allies, uh, shipping and war industries boomed, and then a preview of World War II became the suppliers to Great Britain and France. Uh, once we entered the war, our economy shifted to a war economy. The War Industries Board, which was headed by a gentleman named Berard Baru, uh, this guy right there, uh, tried to essentially uh, create a controlled economy, a command economy centered on the government, uh, and to uh, 
control production of goods. Uh, it works uh, to some extent, is not nearly as elaborate as what we're going to see during World War II, but it does help change the American economy to help fight the war uh, and get our factories humming. Women uh, took the place of men in factories around the nation, helping to get the last push for voting rights in the process. We discover suddenly in 1918 that women can do the jobs that men were doing in the factories, and we're not losing much when women take over. Uh, this is the one final push that the women need to help them uh, become voting citizens in this country. The Selective Service Act was passed in 1917 uh, with World War I to draw uh, American soldiers into the war. Shipyard builders, shipyard workers were exempt from the draft because we were building so many ships and needing so many ships that it was deemed of national importance. As far as the war itself is concerned, World War I is the first modern war in history. There's an old saying that generals fight the last war, and that adage certainly proved true on the Western Front uh, of World War I. The Western Front will be uh, the area along France where the trenches were dug. The new war technology on display quickly rendered old warfare obsolete. The machine gun cut down entire regiments in fixed formation. New artillery expanded the battlefield by miles. And lastly, of course, poison gas became a major weapon. The trench warfare we see here fought on the Western Front uh, also brought a lot of new things like the poison gas into the battlefield. It became an easier method of getting, getting the enemy out of their tr trenches. Of course, of course, if the wind changed direction, you simply gassed yourself, which did happen on occasion. Uh, the, the tank is first developed during World War I. Here's an early example of a tank of the war. Uh, poison gas, mustard and chlorine gas, became very effective. Uh, it was feared by the troops. And you can see here some pictures of some World War I soldiers in gas masks. And the airplane became a prominent fixture and a prominent weapon of World War I. Now, the first planes uh, used during World War I are actually used for reconnaissance. Uh, they'll fly over and see where the gaps in the, uh, in the enemy's positions were, they report back, and then that's where the attack would happen. They start first by arming uh, pilots with pistols. They would fly around and shoot at, shoot at each other. Uh, as they started to first put out machine guns, uh, the, the pilots had a habit of shooting off their propellers or wings uh, and crashing to the ground. On more than one occasion, they would shoot the propeller and the bullet would come back and kill the pilot. Um, as the war went on, they devised a, a timing system where the bullets would actually fire between the propellers uh, this greatly improved the use of airplanes in battle. Uh, they developed levers where the pilot would be sitting in the, in the uh, cockpit and pull a lever and a bomb would fall from the bottom of the plane. Also greatly enhancing the use of the aircraft. Uh, excuse me. Blimps were also used in the war for reconnaissance and Americans and German, French, British soldiers would often take pot shots at the blimps floating well above the battlefield, and uh, most of the time uh, those, fought, those shots uh, fell silently to the ground without hurting the blimp. But uh, you wouldn't see, if we were to travel back in time uh, and look in, in World War I, you would see blimps all over the place up in, uh, up in the sky. Uh, the American troops that arrived were under the direction of General John J. Pershing. They fought separately from the French and the British, uh, and Pershing wanted to make sure that, that the American troops did not fight uh, or, or fought together instead of being separated and thrown in as uh, reinforcements along the French and British lines. American forces fought in Europe barely a year, yet the war brought profound change to the United States. Women would never relinquish the freedom gain and power gain during the war. Great Britain would cede the title of the world's superpower uh, to the United States, however reluctant we were to have it. A better fight would ensue in the United States between President Wilson and Senator Henry Cabot Lodge over the America's role in the post-war world. More than anything, though, World War I helped create a stage for the rise of Europe's dictators in World War II.